Oh, howdy folks. I was just playing a little catch with myself in my bedroom. Say, you ever wonder why a ball dips when you give it a little spin when you throw it? Well, neither have I, but we're gonna learn about it. There's a little ASMR for you, okay. Very quick about the Magnus effect. So this is the effect that you get when you get lift, when you have a rotating sphere or cylinder or object. Um, we'll talk about what causes it in a second. A um, Couple of things about this video. Number one, we are going to be treating primarily spinning, spinning spears, spinning spheres um, as opposed to cylinders. Cylinders have also been pretty um, well studied. So we're gonna focus on spheres, things like ping pong balls. Um, number two is you have to be aware that there's a difference between a situation where the sphere is stationary but spinning and the flow is coming at the object. I think for you it would look like that. Um, and the case where the object is moving, spinning and moving through fluid that is stationary. Okay, so for the example that you see here where the flow is coming from the upper uh, right and moving to the lower left. Um, for, a, for a stationary sphere um, where the flow is moving in that direction, that is, in terms of the physics, um, nearly identical to the situation where the sphere is moving um, in this direction shown here through stationary fluid. And the reason that this is important for this effect is that a lot of the applications are actually objects moving um, through fluids. Um, so a typical application is actually the trajectory of a sports ball where the ball is spinning and it has curve or it has lift um, upwards or downwards. Um, and that's why we need to be aware of this. So my little mantra for you is to um, always put yourself in the frame of reference of the sphere and think about which direction the flow is coming from. That flow direction is going to dictate the drag force. Um, and it will also dictate the lift force depending on the spin direction, okay? So be the sphere and see the flow, okay? So you might want to get that tattooed on your arm or I don't know that maybe like probably not the lower back but maybe just like the inside of your arm so you can kind of glance at that every once in a while, that mantra, and I think that will be helpful. ASMR. Okay, sorry, I couldn't help myself. Um, Let's talk about the flow direction on a spinning ball, okay? And I think this is easiest to explain using a combination of the no-slip condition on the ball and Bernoulli's equation. So for the spinning ball, the fluid that is touching the ball will be stuck to the ball and moving at the velocity of the surface of the ball, which means that the arrows for the flow touching the ball at those locations will be like I just draw, drew there. Now we have to go for the streamlines, okay? So this would be maybe I don't know, maybe the dividing streamline. Um, the flow up here is going to be accelerated because it's moving in the same direction as the surface of the ball, okay? And so the streamlines would tend to converge there. That's how you know that the flow is, is speeding up. And conversely, on the other side of the cylinder, the flow is going to be slowed down a little bit because it's opposing the, the direction of the um, surface of the cylinder there, okay? So what that means is that at the top, or over here, you have high velocity, and at the bottom, over here, you have low velocity. It's not quite the top or the bottom, it's a little bit to the left and the right. Um, according to Bernoulli, where we have high velocity, we have low pressure, okay? So that means that on this side of the object, we have low pressure, and on this side of the object, we have high pressure, and that will cause a lift force in the high to low pressure direction. So let me get another color here so I can highlight that. Let's go with red. So we would have a lift force on the ball, a net force, which is resulting from that asymmetry in the pressure that would look like that, okay? And just to be clear, drag by definition is always in the direction of the relative flow for the object, okay? so. Again, this, this scenario that I'm sketching here could either be the situation where the ball is spinning like you see in the counterclockwise rotation sense and the flow is coming from the upper right to the lower left, or it could be the case where the ball has that same spin but it's moving through stationary fluid 
um, from the left to the upper right, okay? So the, the object could also be moving in the direction like this, okay? Velocity of the object, okay? So, you know, when you're trying to figure out the direction of the Magnus force resulting from the spin, you can draw this Bernoulli diagram and try to figure out high to low. Um, but there's another way that you can do it, okay? And so the other way to do it, if you don't like sports, you know, I give you, an, I give you other options. I don't, I don't require you to know anything about sports. And incidentally, this kind of a, a spin here, if the ball was moving from, from the lower left to the upper right, would be called, um, that would be what we would call backspin. And if you do know, I don't know why I teased you by saying if you don't know sports and then I'm going to talk about sports, but anyway, this is called backspin and that is, um, you know, like in tennis, that would mean that the ball would actually end up kind of veering up like that a little bit, okay? And again, if you don't know anything about sports, that meant nothing to you. So if we don't, if truly, I, I swear this time, if we don't know about sports, is there a way that we can kind of automate uh, figuring out the direction, and we don't want to draw the Bernoulli, can we figure out a way to automate the direction of the, um, the force from the flow onto the spinning ball? And I would like you to think about the cross product, okay? So in this case, we have a few different vectors. The one, let me get another color going here. Um, the one color we have is, this is the velocity of the fluid, so I'll just call that V. Um, and so if we think about the cross product, remember the cross product from calculus, if we cross the velocity with the rotation rate of the, of the object, um, and again, this is the velocity of the fluid, um, we would have that rotation rate kind of coming out of the board, right? So it would be uh, coming out of the page. So I have to do this cross product with my hand, bear with me. So if we cross uh, the velocity, you should do this too. Velocity crossed with the rotation rate, that will actually be in the direction of lift. Um, it, you know, lift direction is in the same direction as V cross omega. And you should take, pause the video and get your hand out, warm it up, do your, your uh, vector crossing like that, okay? So it would actually be in the V cross omega, I believe, direction, okay? The other way to do it is, let's say, what if we tried to do the case where the object is moving through the fluid? If we do velocity of the object cross with omega, is that in the right direction? And I don't think it can be because V object is opposite to V uh, of the fluid. So indeed, if we take that velocity, I got to cross it here, you would actually want to do minus of that, okay? And that would give you the direction of lift, okay? So that is kind of a way to automate it, you know, if, and I don't know that vector cross products are better than sports, but um, I am giving you some options, you know, I'm trying to appeal to all different uh, kinds of interests here, okay? So you can either use velocity of the fluid, this is the fluid velocity for the case where the ball is stationary and cross that with the rotation rate. Um, so again, this would be for uh, ball stationary, or you can do it the other way um, if the fluid is stationary, okay? And the object is moving through the fluid, stationary, okay? So hopefully that's helpful. Okay, really quick, lift and drag coefficients. So we quantify the lift on the spinning ball, the spinning sphere, um, using a lift coefficient. And the definition of the lift coefficient is nearly identical to the drag coefficient, except you have the lift force in the numerator, and then one half rho v squared, your, your flow or object speed squared times the reference area. And the reference area for a sphere, you're lucky, is actually the area that the flow sees, which is pi over 4d squared, okay? And like the drag coefficient, the lift coefficient is a function of the Reynolds number. So the Reynolds number is, is based on the, the sphere diameter. It's based on something that I'll call omega star, which is a non-dimensional rotation rate. And it's also going to be based on the relative roughness here of the sphere, okay? So this parameter omega star is what you see over here on the x-axis of the graph, 
which is the actual rotation rate, and the units of that have to be in radians per second, um, times the diameter divided by twice the velocity, okay? So twice the speed of the flow, I guess I'll go ahead and, and use uh, the letter V since I'm using V, but the, obviously the graph is using U over here. But that's the non-dimensional rotation rate, okay? And it's hard to find one chart that will show you the dependence of all three uh, variables for the lift coefficient. So this is a typical chart, and the thing to note is that this is for a fixed value of the Reynolds number. They didn't mention this, but or they didn't mention it. It's a smooth sphere, so this chart also is for epsilon over d of what would smooth be? That's right, zero, okay? So a zero roughness sphere. So um, this chart is isolating the dependence of the lift and drag coefficients on omega star. One thing I wanna mention, what I just said, drag coefficient is also dependent on the rotation rate of the sphere because it will change the flow pattern in the wake around the sphere, okay? So as a cross check, notice that this is for a fixed Reynolds number. If we dial the rotation all the way down to zero, this value here, you should be able to find that value of the drag coefficient on your standard drag coefficient for a sphere chart for the Reynolds number of 60,000 because that's what that, that value is, okay? So you may want to cross-check. 0.5 is a typical sphere drag coefficient for a lot of Reynolds numbers, a pretty wide range, but that's kind of how you would relate this graph to the, the, the standard graph that you have, which is essentially for omega or the rotation rate equaling zero, okay? That's really all there is to lift of a sphere. We have the direction, we have the magnitude, and I think in another video I'll show you an example where we can really put this to use, okay?